Hello and welcome to the HOA Show, where we discuss the news, problems, trends, and critical issues relating to life in a homeowner association. Join us every episode, and together we'll explore how to survive and thrive in the dizzying world of HOAs. Hello and welcome to the HOA Show. I'm your host, Ryan Gazelle, and today's episode is a very special edition of the HOA Show. Today, we're going to make a departure from our usual interview format, and in acknowledgement of February's Black History Month, we'll be featuring a previously recorded webinar presentation on the civil rights movement and its impact on community associations, led by Sandra Gottlieb and Joan Lewis Hurd from the firm Swettles and Gottlieb. Some of you may recognize Sandra as a friend and returning guest expert on the show, Sandra is a well-known CID attorney and thought leader in the industry and is a managing partner of the law firm Swettles and Gottlieb. Their firm has specialized in law for common interest developments for a long time. She served as the president of multiple chapters for CAI and is a consistent speaker for CID organizations and events throughout California. She's also a member of the CAI College of Community Association Lawyers. Joan Lewis Hurd is a senior associate at the firm. She started practicing law in 1986 and has litigated all types of civil cases, including employment law, real estate, personal injury, and business litigation matters. Having presented and defended everything from Fortune 500 corporations to startup mom-and-pop businesses, Joan has gained a wealth of knowledge enabling her to assist any community association of any size in litigation of nearly every type of matter that may arise in community associations. Evidence of Joan's expertise is ample in her writings, which can be found on the Swettleson Gottlieb HOA Law blog, and her numerous successful trial wins are available on there as well. Without further ado, let's turn the mic over to Sandra and Joan. So I am Sandra Gottlieb, and we are here today to discuss civil rights and homeowner association history, racism, and fair housing and current events. And the goal for today is to really look at where we came from, where we are now, and where we are going to go collectively in the future. I am happy to be sharing today with Joan Lewis Hurd. Joan is a senior associate at our firm, and together we will be going through our uh, history lesson and really coming up with how this history of racism really affects operationally what we do in homeowners associations and who we are and how we go forward. Do you want to set us off and talk about Frederick Douglass and start the process for us, Joan? I'd appreciate Most it. Definitely. Well, if there's no struggle, there is no progress. And Frederick Douglass was a firm believer in equality of all people, whether they're Black, white, female, Native American, Japanese, Chinese. He was also a believer in dialogue and in making alliances across racial divides. And also he was a champion of the liberal values of the U.S. Constitution. It's easy to look back and see how far we've come, but we must also look where we are now and see what a long way that we still have to go. Frederick Douglass would talk to anyone who would listen. He'd even talk to slave owners, and he was criticized a lot by him talking to slave owners and his willing to have that dialogue. And he responded by saying, I will unite with anyone to do right and with no one to do wrong. Thus, even Frederick Douglass kept an open mind, as should we all. Now, the Civil Rights Act of 1866 was 155 years ago. And that declared all male persons born in the United States to be citizens without distinction of race or color or previous condition of slavery or involuntary servitude. It was the first time that Congress legislated on civil rights and the act also banned discrimination in the sale, transfer, lease or use of property, including real estate and housing, and it permitted black people to inherit property. In a Republican-dominated Congress back then that enacted the uh, Civil Rights Act in 1866, the Republican-dominated Congress overrided a veto by then-President Andrew Johnson. In vetoing the bill, Johnson held that Blacks were not qualified to become U.S. citizens and that the measure would operate in favor of the colored and against the white race. And the Senate and the House voted overwhelmingly 
to overturn the president's veto. So then what happened? Although the act made it illegal to discriminate in employment and housing on the basis of race, it had no, no teeth. It had no penalty for violation of the law. And it left it up to the individual victims to seek legal relief. And at that time, it, you know, it was difficult in terms of the lack of the means to be able to gain access to the legal system and the lack of the ability to have the money to get to the legal system to enforce the law. So Sandra, tell us what happened with Shelley versus Kramer and what that did for housing issues. So it's really that that whole part of that act is really quite amazing to me. What's amazing is that the act was created, but there was no penalty that was attached for it, to it. And it really left the people who might be in the least financially uh, successful position of being able to afford legal fees to fight for their rights to be in exactly that position. So what happened is a landmark case, Shelley versus Kramer. And look at the date. It's 1948. And this was a neighborhood that adopted racially restrictive covenants in 1911. In 1945, the Shelleys, an African-American family, bought a house in the neighborhood. Mr. Kramer, a white, more senior member of that community, brought a lawsuit to enforce the covenant and prohibit the Shelleys from moving into their own house. So although restrictive covenants were not subject to the constitutional protection because there was no penalty, for the violation of the law, what we had was a state enforcement which said, you know what, those covenants violate the Equal Protection Clause of the 14th Amendment of the United States Constitution, and everyone is supposed to be treated equally. And in a landmark decision, the United States Supreme Court said, we're going to strike down those racially restrictive covenants and not allow them to have any force and effect going forward. So what happened after Shelley v. Kramer was literally the birth of homeowners associations throughout the United States. It just seemed to have followed in the 50s and 60s. And so associations became really popular after World War II. Young men were returning from war. They were coming home and the United States was on a push to promote family life, both in an urban setting and in the suburbs. And this went on for a 20-year period, the 50s and the 60s. Uh, but many communities had restrictions in their governing documents that prohibited occupancy by Asians, by Blacks, and people of Jewish ancestry. And it was a really awful period of time because we had people that served our country in that war. Um, we know that Black soldiers served as Tuscany members of our armed services, and they came home and they were not able to buy in the neighborhoods with the people that they served. It was they were literally locked out of this housing market. Not one of our best moments, I would say. So what did we do next? Well, we did what we continually do in the United States. We moved forward and we looked for the creation of the Unruh Civil Rights Act. That was in 1959. So it was in the middle of this surge. It started in the early 50s. We're halfway through the 50s, 60s surge. And we had the Unruh Civil Rights Act. This was a federal act and it prohibited discrimination on the basis of race, color, religion, ancestry, or national origin. But it made that prohibition on all business establishments of every kind. And we always say when we deal with our association clients, we know this is your home but this is a business. And we know it's a business because you are, in most cases, a corporation. And you must run your business pursuant to the corporation's code and corporate formalities. And that's addressed in California in the corporation's code and in the California civil code. What was interesting about the Unruh Civil Rights Act is it included real estate brokers in by facially including them if you can't discriminate as a business establishment in housing, those that are selling the housing or leasing the housing are also prohibited from engaging in discrimination. That was a sore spot for a number of years, I can tell you. 
Uh, right after the Henry Civil Rights Act, we also had the Hawkins Act. And what the Hawkins Act did was prohibited racial discrimination in publicly assisted housing. So we wanted to make sure that everybody was protected, even if you were living in publicly assisted housing. So where did we go from this particular law? Well, uh, Joan? Well, the California legislatures in 1961 adopted Civil Code Section 53 and 782. Civil Code Section 53 makes racially restrictive covenants void. And then 782 made racially restrictive conditions in real property deeds also void. Before you have further discussion on that, I want everybody to reflect on what you just said, and I'll come back to that, because I want everybody to look and see how homegrown the adherence people had to the voiding of those restricted covenants. So throughout the 60s, uh, there were marches and protests, and they were taking place all over the country on housing restrictions and housing restrictions in community associations where there were deed restrictions and covenant recordings prohibited people from color and certain religions from living in their housing. This particular picture is from a march in the Bay Area, and this was called the Integration March, and it was in East Palo Alto, and we borrowed this photograph from the Bancroft Library, and it really is a picture of a moment in time because these residents were marching through their community with signs that said the law does not allow you to doing this. We want our neighborhoods to be diverse and we do not want our communities to be resultant in us having, as it was called at the time, Negro ghettos. And it was such an important statement because it was an inclusive march. They didn't want to have these segregated areas. And it was really based on that little girl right in the middle holding the sign, he's my friend. It didn't matter to that person. And the idea to the parents was it shouldn't matter to the rest of us as well. So back to your slide. So William Rumford was a trailblazer. And in 1948, he was the first black person elected to the California legislature from the Bay Area. And he made it clear that there's no meaningful compromise with racial justice. We either have a constitution that protects the civil liberties of all people or we do not. And so he was a pharmacist and he was at the forefront of the struggle to desegregate the West Coast because up through the 60s, the focus of civil rights was the struggle was in the South. And so he was seeking to desegregate the West. And when he joined a Congress in the California legislature, his bills expanded African-Americans access to jobs, schools, housing. And he left a bold record that uh, made him one of the most important lawmakers. He wrote bills to curb job discrimination in schools, racial biases in the National Guard, as well as laws that made it illegal for insurance companies to refuse to cover Black drivers. And then he also helped bring into the existence the Fair Employment Practices Act, which made it illegal for employers to discriminate. And that was passed in 1959. And then by 1963, there was the Rumford Fair Housing Act, and that was almost 100 years from the 1866 Fair Housing Act. <laughs> Such a long time. It was a long time coming, and it barred the practice of discrimination based on race, color, religion, national origin, ancestry, and declared that to be against public policy. It also prohibited discrimination in the sale, rental, or any private dwelling containing more than four units. This was a major fight with no easy solution, and there were protests in cities throughout California. These ordinances, there were laws that were passed, and then they'd keep getting re repealed. And finally, at the state level, with the passage of the Rumsford Fair Housing Act, there was a law on the books in California that prohibited this type of discrimination. And because of the push to try and get rid of the Rumford Fair Housing Act, Martin Luther King came to the Bay Area. And this was done to raise support 
and awareness of the passing of the Civil Rights Bill in the U.S. Senate and to speak out against the attempt to repeal the Rumford Act. And we all know of Martin Luther King's I Have a Dream speech that was done in 1963, uh, where he says that I have a dream that one day this nation will rise up and live out the true meaning of its creed. We hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal. When King was in championing for the West Coast, he made it clear that, you know, the Rumsford Act had to stay in place and he was successful in doing that. However, there were attempts for California to backtrack, as uh, Sandra will explain. So here we had all this momentum going forward, and we thought we were going to be in a place where we'd have less discriminatory practices in housing and in our homeowners associations. But in 1964, we had something called Prop 14. And Prop 14 was sponsored by the California Real Estate Association, the, the realtors, Uh, And they propose an amendment to the state constitution to allow owners and landlords discretion to choose who they sell to and who they rent their property to. And shockingly, the proposition passed because the idea was it's an inalienable right. It is my property and therefore I should be able to do what I want with it. Problem was it was creating a racial divide and really resulting in acts of discrimination. The federal government was not having any of this. And immediately after the proposition passed, the federal government cut off all housing funding to California and said that is not coming back until this is off of the books. So what happened? Things aren't cured right away. What we know that sometimes it takes litigation in order to go back to the progressive area that we were where legislation took it away. And two years later, We had the Reitmans, who were Black. They wanted to rent an apartment in Orange County, California, and they were denied the ability to be the tenants of a unit because they were Black. This case went all the way up to the California Supreme Court, who held that Proposition 14 is unconstitutional because it violated, we already said this once, the equal protection and due process provisions of the 14th Amendment of the United States Constitution. Everybody was supposed to be treated equally. The court went on to say that Proposition 14 on its face established an environment conducive to discrimination. And that was the end of that. And it was an extremely important decision. And unfortunately, two steps forward, three steps back, What happened in the summer of 1966, Joan? Well, we have to backtrack a year, just going to the summer of 1965, in August 11th, 1965, when the Watts riots were set off. And that was important because during the 60s, the focus was so much on the South in terms of the uh, segregation and Martin Luther King. But a lot of people... A a lot of Black people and people of color had moved north to Chicago or moved west to California. And so those uh, people that had moved to California, they were just ready to just set it off. They were ready to riot and make the world understand that there are problems going on in the West Coast. And so once the riots were set off, Martin Luther King came along and came to some of the marches in California And then he also participated in marches in Chicago. And Chicago had started this freedom movement. And that freedom movement kind of mushroomed across the country to go more than just in the South, but all over the country from the East Coast to the West Coast. Although in July of 1966, King placed a list of demands on the door of the Chicago City Hall to gain leverage with those city leaders. And it wasn't just for housing, it was for employment, it was for voting, it was police brutality. And some of the things that he had uh, put on the list were with respect to housing, were that uh, real estate boards and brokers had to make public statements that all listings available would be available on a non-discriminatory basis. And similar with banks and savings institutions to make sure that loans were available to people of all colors 
and without regard to the racial composition of the neighborhood that they were providing the loan for the property. And then there was also a demands to clean up slumlord type of properties in those slumlord neighborhoods. And that was just to uh, you know name a few of them. So that was in 1966. We're going to talk about somebody named Clarence Mitchell. This guy was really um, something. He was a champion of civil rights, and he was a champion of civil rights in housing in particular. Um, And he was called affectionately the 101st senator. He was not elected as a senator, but he was involved in everybody's business in the Senate because he had people's ears and he knew how to collaborate. He was a big player in the NAACP, and he was its first labor secretary, and he was a chief lobbyist in the NAACP and uh, was instrumental in the creation of the following civil rights laws, the 1957 Civil Rights Act, the 1960 Civil Rights Act, the 1964 Civil Rights Act, the 1965 Voting Rights Act, and then the 1968 Fair Housing Act. The reason he was so successful is he tried to mesh ideologies and to establish that people who might be similarly situated would have a certain type of base that would support each other, even if they looked different and they sounded different. And so from his position in the NAACP, he became an advocate with the National Council of Churches and a number of Jewish secular organizations. And that's the Anti-Defamation League, the American Jewish Congress, and the American Jewish Committee. And he identified both as being people who had suffered acts of discrimination in all areas, but acts of discrimination also in housing. And by putting all of those parties together, the American Jewish Committee was able to provide a great many resources to send out the message and the resources were providing legal counsel to assist with legal issues and funding and political support so that lobbying was in place so that we were not continuously backtracking on the advances that we were making. This guy really had a really very colorful history. If there was an important bill on the Senate floor, he literally would have people go into bathrooms and bring senators out so they were on the floor and that they didn't miss a vote. He also was very knowledgeable as to whether or not a particular amendment to an existing bill that could possibly affect housing could be negatively impacted by what may seem like just a minor amendment. So he was really a big player, and he brought that big player really brought us to the Fair Housing Act of 1968. And this was really the pinnacle of Fair Housing Act because it really blatantly banned discrimination in the sale, the rental, and financing of real property. It was that moment in time. It just took 102 years to get there after the 1866 Civil Rights Act. But he was popular and he was an advocate for barring discrimination in housing, and he did that, he did it well. The Fair Housing Act actually said that you could no longer discriminate. And it had a a penalty that was attached to it because it said, if you have a restrictive covenant in your community, regardless of whether or not that covenant was voluntarily accepted by the members of that community, its enforcement was blatantly illegal. So it's sort of interesting when we talk about community associations and people who don't like an amendment to the governing documents, and they'll say, well, I bought the into this community based on those covenants that I have a right to rely on them. We know in California, that's not true, because the Davis-Sterling Act says that your governing documents can be amended, and so do most governing documents. And this Fair Housing Act was really, in 1968, gave us the birth of the fact that we could have covenants that potentially are not enforceable. Joan and I recognize that when we provide legal advice to our clients, that we are constantly saying that recorded covenants are presumed reasonable by the courts, and they are, unless they are illegal on their face. And that's really what happened in the Fair Housing Act 
is those amendments became illegal on their face. So here we made great progress, but it wasn't over, was it, Joan? We went to the next stop and who showed up? <laughs> so fast forwarding about 40 years when everybody got to uh, vote for uh, president and Obama served as president from January 2009 to 2017. And he said that the march isn't over and the work is not yet completed and better words were never spoken because that is so true. A black president did not erase racism. And uh, in addition to saying that the march isn't over, he also said the legacy of slavery, Jim Crow, discrimination in almost every institution of our lives that casts a long shadow. And that's still part of our DNA that's passed on. We're not cured of it. It's not a matter of overt discrimination. Societies don't overnight completely erase everything that happened 200 to 300 years ago. And despite progress, racism does still exist. As recently as a couple of years ago, a board president asked me if I got into UCLA under affirmative action. I, he had the gall to say it out loud. Imagine how many other racist thoughts uh, and racist people might have had racist thoughts, but just didn't say them out loud. So that just goes to show that the struggle isn't over. And it's a struggle for, um, for everyone. Talk to us about how that struggle applies to homeownership. Well, in uh, 2000, America's homeownership rate reached a record of 67, almost 68%. 71.6 million American families had owned a home in that year. But the rates for Black Americans owning their own home were very low. And as recently as 2000, Black homeownership lagged behind the country with only 44% of Black Americans owning their home in 2020, according to Redfin, compared to 74% for uh, white Americans. In California, it's even lower. Only 34% of Black Californians own a home, according to the National Association of Realtors. In the Bay Area, the numbers are even lower. It's just 33% of Black San Francisco residents own a home, compared to 61% of white San Franciscans, and that's also according to Redfin. So what does that mean for us? Well, two steps forward, two steps back. This is an important case, so it's a little tricky, and I'm going to just uh, briefly give you some background about it. So this is the Texas Department of Housing and Community Affairs. Also in 2015, when President Obama said that the walk and the race is not over to make certain that we remove discrimination, we are all the sum of our parts. The, the Department of Housing and Community Affairs sued this organization called Inclusive Communities Project. And the backstory on this case talked about low income housing credits that were given by the federal government distributed to developers to build low cost housing. And what happened is that the credits were being given to developers to build that housing in economic communities that were, shall we say, lower on the scale than their Caucasian white counterpart communities. And the Inclusive Communities Project said that doesn't seem very fair because it's creating these ghettos again. You're only giving these incentives to build low cost housing to developers and it only applies to areas that are in minority neighborhoods and you don't get the incentive to build low cost housing in the Caucasian neighborhoods. You are continuing this line of discrimination. That's what the case stood for. And the case held that the Fair Housing Act focuses on the consequence of actions rather than the actor's intention. This is an extremely important change in understanding racial discrimination or any kind of discrimination. And why it was important is so many times when we deal with allegations against our associations, our board members, and even managing agents. And we will hear people say, we didn't mean to do that. It's not really that issue. The issue is, what was the consequence of those actions? 
did the consequence of those actions show something different than your intent? In this case said, the result or the consequence of those actions are what's important. And it really opened the door for people to be plaintiffs in lawsuits to counteract unconscious prejudice and disguised discrimination and biases. We all have a bias. We'd like to think that we don't. It doesn't mean that we have a discriminatory intent, but we have to watch for the decision of our actions, not what we meant to happen. So this was a very pivotal case for us in 2015, and it really has changed how we evaluate claims of harassment and discrimination against our homeowners associations and our associations' uh, boards of directors. We are known for saying, if you get a complaint, do not respond to it yourselves. It is not because we are hoping that you are going to call us up and say, oh, yay, this is a great day for you. We are going to be bringing you business. It's because the nuance of the effect might escape people who are not trained to see those nuances, attorneys. And we now had a brand new way of looking at discrimination in our housing from what I intended to do to what the discriminatory effect is. You could take us through that, Joan? Yes. Yeah, so the discriminatory effect uh, is basically it, your intentions, good, bad, or indifferent, don't matter. It's what the effect of the action is. And one of the examples of that discriminatory effect, and we call it a disparate impact, is occupancy restrictions. Now, occupancy restrictions from an intent standpoint seem like a great idea. You know, you only want, you know, two people per bedroom, and that way you don't have a million people living in the place, and you don't have, you know, so much more in terms of the uh, foot traffic through the common areas and things of that nature. That seems like it makes sense. So the intent doesn't matter. What's the effect of that? Well, the effect of that is when you limit the occupancy of two persons per bedroom, it has the effect of precluding families with children from residing in a community if they can only afford a one bedroom unit. And that discriminatory effect is based on familial status. And the UNRWA Civil Rights Act of uh, Section 51 precluded occupancy restrictions from existing in homeowners associations or any other types of buildings, with the exception of senior housing. And it's important because that disparate impact on a group of individuals, if it increases the, the costs or reinforces the uh, discrimination or perpetuates se segregated housing, based on a membership in a protected class, that is now precluded. And so, Sandra, what can be done about discrimination? So for in, in case the subtleties of this is, are really missed on anybody, we've really gone from the racial discrimination to now discrimination against people who are in protected classes and the people that it can affect. It certainly would make sense to an association if there was a one bedroom unit that had seven people living in it, that as you said, Joan, that there is certainly more foot traffic, wear and tear on the common area, possibly violation of the association's governing documents through nuisance complaints or you know sounds uh, that may be emanating from a unit or actions on the common area. Those may be really actions that are precursors or presets to acts of bias or acts of discrimination. So really, what can we do? We can engage as we are now in the education process. We thought it was important when dealing with this topic and bringing this to you today so you could see the history, the history of where we started and the history of where we are now. We are in a good place if we take control of it if we continue on the educational process and move each other along through this education, you also wanna be engaging in, in best practices. Don't accept mediocrity in your association where these actions are going on behind the scene without the association's board of directors or their managing agent really taking action to keep this 
from happening, from having this effect of discrimination take hold of your community. And the last bullet point here is be the change. Remember, it's not our intent now. It is the effect of what happened and what we did. Be the change so we know that the demands against our associations really can be defended if they are, are deemed to be appropriate to be defended. Joan, what do we do with this, with education? Give well, us a little education bit more. Is key. That's the way you can continue to learning through professional networks, through things such as this type of webinar. And it doesn't have to be a webinar that we do, but, uh, you know, there's plenty of webinars out there. Understanding the association's potential for liability and who is responsible, educating the boards, educating members of homeowners associations, educating the managers, how best to identify discriminatory behavior. Really, what's a board to do? It's to know your responsibilities. What's the manager to do? Know your responsibilities. You know, I can't stress it enough. And you need to make sure that you don't have biases that you don't recognize are really biases. So it's just a continuation of moving forward at all particular times. I don't know if any of you saw an email that we had sent out to you to really check whether or not you have implicit biases, and it turns out that we all do. If you go on Harvard Education's website, there are 10 different tests that you can take. It takes less than 10 minutes. You don't have to join to be able to take the test. You just need to go on and go through the questions because it's really very important for self-learning. I went through and took a number of the tests. And, and I was actually surprised by some of the results in how I look at certain things. So if you haven't done it, I suggest that you do because it's all part of that educational process. And it really helps us with understanding implicit and unconscious biases. So if you aren't already aware of the fact, know that there are environmental influences that affect us. It's sort of the group mentality or the horde mentality. So if you have a bias, your environment can bring that out in a way that is less than flattering and certainly result in different acts of harassment and discrimination. If we don't know and recognize that we have certain of those biases, then we're really not able to self-correct or call it out effectively in others. So I'm going to use an example uh, because we were preparing for this seminar and there's a television program I like called The Good Doctor. It's a Canadian television show and uh, The Good Doctor is actually a very interesting character on this show. And he's not the feature of my comment. There was a, a black doctor who was working in the emergency room, a young woman, really on the high end of her game. And another person came in to the emergency room, her patient. And she was a very heavy, very loud black woman with a big afro. And she was going in and out of consciousness. And she was saying that she had a high blood pressure and she takes high blood pressure medicine. For whatever reason, the treating doctor, uh, who is black, didn't believe her. And because she didn't believe her, she made assumptions because of her size, her being loud, her afro that she wasn't really taking that medicine. And she actually prescribed a medical procedure that was harmful to her patient. And she was called out on it in a big way by the patient when she came through, who recognized immediately that she was not believed. And it was an important thing because the treating doctor said, I can't believe that I just engage in discriminatory conduct against somebody else who was black. And I was a doctor trying to treat that person. And I think it was a perfect example and worthy of comment about we never know where our bias is and how it can affect us. And we say all the times when we do individual board member training on acts of discrimination and how to protect both them, their managers, and the associations, we have to recognize those biases so we can keep them under control. Last year, I had a situation at a high rise in Northern California. A well-known rapper was moving into a high rise. He's black. 
And the board of directors was listening to homeowners who had gotten wind of the fact this was going to happen. They wanted the board to do something. Really what they wanted the board to do was stop this black rapper from buying into their community. And they said things like, if he moves in here, there's going to be gangs and there's going to be crime and there's going to be parties and multiple violations of the association's governing documents. Even though there was no public history of the fact that this person who was buying in had a public history of drug use, no ties to criminal conduct. There were so many biases in play here against entertainers, people who are rappers, who an assumption was made that somehow they are the gangsta of our music industry, and biases that were so in play and so unknown or unrecognized by the board. I will tell you, I credit the manager by calling me and saying, we have a problem here. This is an amazing board. And they were, and they are. But they got off on the wrong foot because they weren't recognizing their own biases and they were not recognizing the biases of those people that were making demands on them to do something. Talk about harassment, Joan. Yeah, well, just one thing just to add to what you were just talking about in terms of the unconscious bias. I mean, just think about it as you're if you're in a crowd or if you're walking down the street, uh, you know, for women that clutch their purse when they happen to see a young black person with their pants hanging halfway off their butt, you know, and then they clutch their purse. I mean, I do it too. It's an unconscious bias. Yes, it is. That type of thing. And, you know, similarly with men that might want to, you know, just sort of, oh, man, I'll put my wallet in my front pocket instead of my back pocket as they're, you know, walking through that type of situation. You know, the unconscious bias is there in all of us. And so it's just a matter of making sure that we are not overtly treating people based on those unconscious biases. Now, getting to harassment, harassment doesn't take a whole bunch of acts of harassment. A single incident or a series of events can have an adverse impact on another person's well-being. And whether that's emotional, psychological, if it includes discrimination towards a protective class, and almost everybody is in a protective class of some point, of some sort, whether it's race, national origin, sexual preference, gender, gender assignment, age, familial status, creed. The list is, you know, the list. Wait, my new personal favorite, hair. In California, we have a protected (laughs) class of of people for hairstyles. Exactly. So the the braids and the, the, the twists and things like that, you can't discriminate based on that either. And, you know, once again, just about everybody's in some sort of protective class. So the the key is to make sure that you don't discriminate based on any of those protections. And it's not really necessary for the plaintiff to prove specific damages as a result of the harassment. They only need to prove that a reasonable person subject to that discriminatory conduct would find the harassment altered the working conditions or the housing conditions or made it more difficult in their job or their housing conditions. Again, a single incident is enough. There's different types of harassment, quid pro quo, and I always have difficulty saying that, (laughs) Um, harassment. And that's where, uh, you know, the type of thing where it's, oh, well, if you sleep with me, then I'll give you preference for whatever. You know, that's unwelcomed conduct or an unwelcomed ask. And if it's made a condition for the sale or rental or availability of housing, then that's quid pro quo harassment. Um, You know, that also fits for other types of discrimination as well, not just for housing discrimination, but employment and the like. A hostile environment harassment, that refers to unwelcome conduct that's sufficiently severe or pervasive to interfere with the availability, sale, rental, or use or enjoyment of a dwelling the terms, conditions, or privileges of the sale or rental of a real property, the enjoyment of the services that are connected with the facility, any of that type of discrimination or hostility can constitute an adverse action. So Joan, if I could just step in for a second, this is really the one of the changes that came out of the 2016 government code 
where we used to say when these types of things were going on, these incidents that were going on between neighbors, we used to say, oh, that's a neighbor to neighbor dispute. It's not something that the association is involved in because it's just between those two folks. But now that we have the hostile environment harassment as a recognized embodiment of harassment, we can't do that anymore. And we shouldn't be doing that. It requires the association to investigate whether or not they have any obligation to stop that type of harassment. And as you said, it can be a single incident, but it can be a single incident. It doesn't have to be an ongoing pervasive issue. So when you have two neighbors that are fighting, you have to look for the underlying issue there of what they are doing to each other to make certain that the association doesn't have an obligation to the extent that it has the power to do so, to take action. Should you be taking action under your governing documents? Remember the question the judge asks at the beginning of a trial. Does your association comply with its governing documents? If you have a nuisance provision and you didn't at least investigate that and as necessary, call somebody to a hearing for violating the governing documents, you won't be able to answer that question honestly to the court when asked. Exactly. And discrimination comes in many forms. It can be expressed or implied. It can be verbal. It can be physical. It can be visual. It can be unwelcome sexual or gender related conduct. It can be any type of coercion, intimidation, a threat, the type of thing where it's like, well, you know, I'm going to tell your wife if you don't do X, Y, and Z, taking any kind of adverse action based on harassment. It can be revealing private information to third parties or the threat for doing it. It can be a single incident. Retaliation is also prohibited. And it's conduct that can be by anyone. Like an association can be liable for the discrimination conduct by a board member, a manager, an employee, a vendor, a homeowner, a resident, a tenant, a guest, the UPS guy, the FedEx person, Uber Eats delivery, even a, repeating the language used by someone else can be seen as being complicit. So a retweet can do it, you know, bringing this into the 21st century. And it's important. And I know, Sandra, you had, uh, we had the issue in our office with the UPS guy. So I once left my, um, personal office in my office and I came around um, our hallway and I was standing in front of our receptionist desk, uh, which is at the entry of our office. And I see she's literally bent over with her body on top of her lap and she is sobbing. And I said her name. I said, what's wrong? I immediately went and closed the front door, came back and said, what is wrong? How can I help you? Unbeknownst to me, and this is really that see something, say something argument that is really so very important. The UPS guy had been sexually harassing her for onwards of six months, and she never told anybody. And every single day she was all pent up because she knew it was time for him to come. And every day without failure, he did something that made her feel unsafe in her work environment. I told her we had no idea and that we need to know so that we can properly protect her and others. We immediately called the regional director for UPS and we said this person is not to return to this unit or suite ever. And we made an additional demand. We don't want him in the building. I didn't want to have to deal with as the employer, her having to on any daily basis, be afraid that she would run into him is very, very important whenever the association is presented from anyone, whether it's an owner, a tenant, a manager, saying like there's harassment going on, the association needs to investigate and look at the issue. Part of the direct liability is failing to take prompt action. If the association knows or could have known that it was going to be a problem. An employee can be directly liable along with the association for its housing issues. 
It's very important that if the issue comes from a government entity, that the very first thing that is done is to contact the association's legal counsel. This isn't to drum up business for us. We're not legal counsel to everyone. So whoever the association's legal counsel is, contact them first. Don't say like, oh, well, I'm just going to take a look at what this uh, complaint is. And I'll just say, well, no, we never intended to, you know, be involved in this. And, you know, we didn't know or we didn't this or that. Just, you know, the types of things that the average layperson could do, because once they do that, that can be problematic. And you don't get a do-over. You really don't get a do-over. You have to make sure that your first impression is your best impression. And so therefore, to have someone with the legal background to be able to respond. So to protect the associations, HUD recommends education. And we said this before, educate your board members, your employees, your managers about the Fair Housing Act and the types of discrimination that they should be aware of. And it doesn't just have to be racial discrimination. There's all kinds of discrimination that could go on, whether it's familial discrimination, sexual harassment types of discrimination. Develop anti-discrimination policies and rules for the association. Those are very important. Act promptly to address complaints from residents. Don't just say it's, up. Oh, that's a neighbor-to-neighbor dispute. No, that's an association problem. Have the par- at least offer to have the parties come to speak to the board, try to air their grievances and see if you can, whether it's an IDR, a mediation, or just a come to a meeting and like, let's discuss it. We're open to suggestions because once you at least act like you're engaging in the dispute and trying to do something about it, that will go a long way to defend the association if it escalates to the association or a manager or board member or uh, anyone, an employee getting involved in some sort of lawsuit or discriminatory claim. So one of the things that's important is, you know, have a board meeting and have a policy as to how the board meeting will go. There's a possibility of censure if it happens to be a board member. You can censure them if they're the ones that are doing the harassment. There can be some sort of official reprimand, a fine, a dispute resolution policy, adopt a code of conduct, just making it clear to the membership, the employees that there's a zero tolerance for harassment and discrimination. All of those types of things and policies go a long way because it can stop the problem before it happens. And If the problem has happened, it can at least show that the association's willing to do something to try and stop it. Now, the association can't be held liable if it can't solve the problem, but the association can be held liable if it doesn't even try to solve the problem. And that's what is important. It's very, very important that associations remove those antiquated and unenforceable discriminatory restrictions. And while the CCNR's cover pages say that, well, anything that's in here that's unenforceable, you know, the racial restrictions are unenforceable and things like that, but it's best to remove the language. And one of the reasons why is that, think about it, if the association gets sued for some sort of like racial discrimination, for instance, one of the things that, you know, people can just point to is like, well, like, look at their documents. You know, their documents say that you can't have uh, Negroes in the association or the Negroes can't own in the association. Well, even though the cover page says like, well, that's not enforceable anymore, it just doesn't bode well for the look of the association to have such negative and nasty comments in a governing document that's recorded with the, you know, with the county. So it is best to remove those language. And that's removal of that type of language from the governing documents doesn't take a vote of the membership because it's illegal language anyway. And so it's just best to restate those documents to get rid of the bad language. So what are the best practices? 
take these grievances seriously. Investigate all complaints when they're received or witnessed by someone and document it. You know, if somebody says like, oh, this person groped me and Jane saw it. Well, talk to Jane. Well, did you see it? Talk to the person that groped. What, you know, like, what the heck were you thinking? And, you know, if it's necessary to contact the police, contact the police. Whatever it's necessary to do or what the association can do, because it can't do everything. But when it can do something, it's very important to do something. If you receive a complaint, again, do not respond to it yourself. There are no do-overs. It's very important that you contact your legal counsel to determine what action to take. And if the association really can't solve the problem, the association can direct the person who's the target of the harassment to go to the court system itself to get a restraining order to stop the harasser. And as long as the association is at least taking part in trying to do something, the chances are the association won't find itself as a defendant in a lawsuit with respect to that harassment. Again, be proactive. Take the corrective actions that a board of directors can take, such as verbal and written warnings to offending owners or tenants, reporting harassing conduct to the police, Establishing an anti-harassment policy and complaint procedure. You know, an anti-harassment policy, they can be drafted by your association's council. It's not a very expensive proposition, but it will go very far to save the association a lot of money because it will show to whether it's the Department of Fair Employment and Housing, HUD, or any of the other federal or state agencies that the association is actually trying to do something in betterment of the discrimination or harassment issues. And so that it doesn't have this sort of history of harassment. It has a history of trying to prevent harassment. And so that goes a long way with the procedure. So be the change. Have open and honest conversations about racism. And again, have your attorneys, whoever they may be, present a class on what to do. Encourage encourage the general membership and your employees and your managers to say something if they see something. And that way, the association will be in the position that it won't have its head in the sand and it will know and have an idea of what to do. And once contacting the association's counsel, it will know how to best prevent uh, these types of situations. So we have some online resources. So you can look at our blog at hoalawblog.com. Check out our resources that are online. You can find Sandra at slg at sghoalaw.com. And you can find me at jlh at sghoalaw.com. Or at, you can just pick up the phone and give us a call at 800-327-2207. And again, we'd like to thank you so much for joining us. Well, folks, that's our show for today. Thanks so much for listening. We'd like to thank Sandra and Joan for sharing their time and expertise with us. For more information about this presentation and learning more from Sandra and Joan, feel free to reach out to their office at 310-207-2207. And you can visit their firm's website at lawforhoas.com with an S at the end. As we end our episode, we'd like to remind our listeners that if you have any comments, questions, or suggestions for topics that you'd like to learn more about, you can email us at feedback at hoashow.org. Join us next time on The HOA Show. To share or subscribe to The HOA Show, visit us at hoashow.org. There, you'll be able to listen to other episodes, find helpful resources relating to HOAs, provide feedback, submit questions, and check out other great stuff. The HOA Show podcast has been made possible by the contributions of Klein Agency insurance brokers, leaders in the community association industry. The views and opinions expressed by the podcast, its presenters and guests, do not constitute legal advice. For more information on how the topics and discussion apply to you, please consult with your own legal counsel.